Now, today's topic is looking at the whole area of unconventionals, and our talks are really looking at two different threads, um, sort of technology underpinning what's happened in shale gas and shale oil um, in the USA and how far that is transportable into Europe or, and or indeed the UK. And then the other aspect is what is the resource globally, uh, does it all make economic sense and, and potentially what might there be to look forward to. <coughs> um, one of the things I would say is I, I spend a lot of time um, accumulating articles largely off the internet, occasionally out of um, newspapers on various uh, oil and gas topics and, and by far the most of them are about the whole unconventional area. You find many more on uh, unconventionals, for example, than you do on things like Macondo and safety and Frigg and, uh, sorry, Elgin and Total and so on, many, many more. Um, so I thought to begin with, I would try and uh, and I, I, I sort of have uh, an introduction to begin with and then a summary at the end, which will take a slightly different tack. But I thought I'd try and establish some of what I see in these thousands of articles to begin with about uh, technology. And so as you see, my uh, talk here is saying uh, below ground we have the uh, technology. And what that's really saying is that our industry continues to make fantastically rapid technological progress, actually, in the whole area of uh, <coughs> un unconventional resources of various sorts. The various sorts is an important point. Uh, and just to introduce a bit of terminology here that I favour, uh, you can really... I mean, most people, when they talk about unconventional at the moment, think instinctively of shale gas and possibly shale oil. You know, my contention is that there are other categories of unconventional. First of all, un unconventional hydrocarbons, uh, heavy oil, um, sour gas, uh, waxy crude and so on, and then unconventional reservoirs of all sorts, uh, coal beds, uh, tight sandstones, shale, uh, and so on. And, um, you know, there's a whole panoply of where hydrocarbons of different types may uh, be reservoired. And, you know, my convention, or contention, sorry, is that we have the technology really to extract hydrocarbons of any sort wherever they're reservoired. And this is a sort of new thing arising out of the progress that's been made in the U.S. in particular, U.S. and Canada more generally perhaps, but U.S. in particular, over the last uh, five or ten years. Um, if you, again, look at this vast amount of literature, you can say crudely there's half a dozen different technologies which are relevant here. Um, and I have two slides, uh, three topics on each. Um, but the first one is actually to say there is a regional geology activity that in many ways has gone neglected in oil and gas companies for a long time because if you're working offshore, you can in fact get away simply with exploring with uh, large 3D seismic surveys. And if you're going to start looking at unconventionals, you need to have a real grip on regional geology uh, in particular, do intensive biostratigraphic and sedimentological and geochemical work. Uh, so that's a technology. Uh, increasingly 3D helping find sweet spots and increasingly wireless 3D, so um, people not having to, hundreds of people not having to walk around the onshore with uh, huge amounts of cable. Obviously, horizontal drilling, uh, you know, very long-reach horizontal drilling, an increasing number of laterals drilled from one uh, starting borehole, if you will. Um, and there is more, of course, 
everybody, I think, uh, even the Daily Telegraph have heard of fracking, and that's quite a, quite a, that's quite a big step, actually. Um, you know, fracking to maximise flow rates and recoveries from reservoirs, more and more fracking stages, bigger and bigger oomph going into the fracks. Um, particularly in the US, less developed here, you have two or three companies that are making a real business out of monitoring, first of all, the sort of really micro seismic events that are associated with fracking itself. Uh, as a way of monitoring where the fractures get going or, 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 or more accurately in which rocks they're remaining. And then um, microseismics as a way of, um, gather, uh, of guarding against many earthquakes. So um, there are companies like Microseismic, uh, Spectroseism and, and these guys who are all heavily uh, into this field and growing very quickly. And there's, there's a whole panoply of um, companies involved in, uh, you know, this, this, this activity uses enormous amounts of water, absolutely enormous amounts of water compared with conventional drilling. And um, nobody wants to dump that water back in the rivers or into a lake, so it has to be cleaned. And there's a whole industry developed around cleaning and certifying the cleanliness of, of returned uh, water, flowback water as it's sometimes called. So there are just touching on half, a, and those seem to be the main technology themes. There are others, I'm not saying this is a comprehensive list. But a, a result is, and I'm grateful to, our, to my uh, friends in Cambridge Energy for this slide. Uh, they are the, our uh, the second speaker after, after me. But all this is doing is saying, the, the technology that we're deploying uh, below ground as it progresses has a big impact above ground in the footprint of what you see in, uh, in this case, shale gas and shale oil development. So the, the, the picture on your right is from the early days of this wave of, uh, of uh, unconventional exploration. Uh, actually pursuing shale gas in the Barnett. Uh, and you can see in the, uh, the, the acreage pattern at the top in the yellow boxes the intensity of well locations that you needed at that time. Uh, and if you look on the left, um, as you look at it, you have a, uh, an oil development using more modern technology, so better sweet spotting, more horizontal wells from an individual well pad, more laterals, uh, more intense fracking, more frack stages, and so on. And you can see that the number of uh, well locations necessary to develop something is dropping. At the level where you're beginning to be able to stand on one well rig and say, can I actually see another one in the distance? It's a big change from the images that we saw perhaps uh, four or five years ago of very intense rigs, lots of containers all over the place and, and so on. So a big change and enabled by technology progress. So my take, and I thought it's worth sharing that with you, is when you look at this sort of Niagara Falls of literature that exists at the moment, if you just pick up the technology bit, and, and allow my sort of general classification of conventional, unconventional hydrocarbons and unconventional reservoirs. In principle, nowadays, you can say uh, we have the technology to extract hydrocarbons from pretty well anywhere, uh, pretty well any hydrocarbons from pretty well anywhere. I mean, obviously, the economics um, are a significant issue, and whether we can do it uh, environmentally correctly and re responsibly are a significant issue, but technologically we can do pretty well anything, I would assert. On that positive note, um, our first speaker is from Bernstein. Uh, Bernstein have been friends of ours for a long time, always come along and give uh, very good, insightful reports, usually... <coughs> 
you know, I anticipate on Friday when we send our, uh, we will send all of you a, a little survey uh, in the next couple of days saying what did you think of the talks, what do you think of the refreshments. And I anticipate that my introduction will probably get about two out of ten, maybe, and the Bernstein paper will get 9.5. Uh, they're always popular, always do well, and um, Rob West is here from Bernstein to uh, begin proceedings and talk about the global significance of uh, unconventional. Rob, over to you. And as I say, if you have...